Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, uh, Bill Sharp. Our show today, Taiwan's relations with Latin America, and joining us from Washington, D.C., where it's 11 o'clock at night, and we really appreciate that, is Dr. Garrett Vanderweis. Uh, he is a professor of Taiwan history at George Mason University. He also was a Taiwan fellow in Taiwan very recently, where he did three months of research on uh, the Dutch period of Taiwan history. Uh, he's a return guest to Asian Review, and we'd like to welcome him back. Welcome, Garrett. Glad to be on your show. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Appreciate that. Oh, no problem whatsoever. Should also uh, mention that he's an advisor to the Global Taiwan Institute, which is going to have a big um, seminar, conference, uh, however you want to call it, this Wednesday in Washington, D.C. Uh, looks like the panels for that will be really great. And um, wish I could go. Anyway, let's get back to, the, uh, to Taiwan's relations with Latin America. Well, Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen recently made an official trip to Paraguay and Belize, and um, two diplomatic uh, allies in Latin America. And um, on the outbound portion of her travel from Taiwan, she made a stopover in Los Angeles. And um, so what's the significance of her stopover in L.A.? What did she do while she was there? How, how should we see it? Well, I think overall we can say that the uh, room for maneuver she has received from the U.S. Uh, on her stopovers has been uh, significantly increased as compared to previous occasions. On previous occasions, uh, she was basically told to keep a low profile, uh, not talk to the press, not have public speeches. But uh, this time around, uh, those restrictions have been uh, dropped. And we hope that they continue to be uh, dropped for future occasions. Uh, she was able to give a public uh, speech uh, right in front of the uh, Ronald Reagan Presidential Library, where she did uh, quote the former president, who, uh, after his uh, 1986 Reykjavik, Reykjavik meeting with Russian leader Gorbachev, said, everything is negotiable except our freedom and our future. Mm. And of course, for her, that does apply to the Taiwan situation, where she has tried to portray a uh, flexible image on the one side, but on the other side has been very firm on Taiwan's sovereignty, freedom, and uh, the ability of the people in Taiwan to determine their own future. So that was really a, a high point uh, of the event, of the visit. And she was also able to uh, meet with quite a number of members of the U.S. Congress, including uh, Brett Sherman, who is the uh, ranking member on the Democratic side, on the uh, subcommittee Asia-Pacific uh, in the House. Uh, she was able to meet with Cory Gardner, who is the chair of the uh, Senate Subcommittee for Asia-Pacific. And he especially flew to Los Angeles to meet with her. So I think that is quite significant that she was able to have these high-level contacts with people in the U.S. Congress, that she was able to uh, speak uh, at a public event, and that the Rus uh, Taiwanese press was able to follow her around and write about her uh, uh, her experiences in Los Angeles. That's great. I remember she also met with uh, House Foreign Affairs uh, Committee Chairman uh, Royce, who's a longtime supporter of Taiwan. Yeah, indeed, Royce was also there, and. Uh, he has been incredibly supportive of uh, Taiwan all along. And this is important because he is the chair of the uh, House Foreign Affairs Committee. And uh, he even made a statement saying that as a strong defender of the U.S.-Taiwan relationship, I will continue to work to make our partnership even stronger. And a prosperous Taiwan is good for the people of Taiwan but also good for stability of the Asia-Pacific region 
and also good for U.S. national security. So he brought that in also. It's not just for Taiwan that we are talking, but it's also for U.S. interests in the region. Mm, that's really good. That's worth its weight in gold. Um, she did have one little incident in Los Angeles. She visited a well-known coffee shop, uh, which is Taiwan-owned, and then the, the mainland was very upset about that. Yeah, that was so very petty and childish, the reaction from the Chinese side. This is a coffee shop, 85 degree bakery, which is a very popular Taiwanese-owned uh, chain, which has branches in the U.S., Taiwan, Australia, Hong Kong, and in China. And she just dropped in, you know, to have a nice uh, little chat with the uh, people in the shop. And she signed a pillow for one of the workers there. But after this uh, visit became public, all hell broke loose. Mm. And uh, Chinese netizens uh, basically uh, were in an orchestrated hateful harassment campaign, lambasting the coffee chain and threatening to boycott, mm. uh, boycott its establishments in China. So the coffee chain, a couple days later, issued a meek statement that they uh, declared to support the, uh, One China, which is incredibly uh, silly of, of Beijing to do it this way, because it really estranges people in Taiwan. People in Taiwan feel offended. People in Taiwan right. feel, uh, the feelings feel hurt. And this really doesn't do uh, very much for a positive image of Beijing in Taiwan. And that's, that's basically what Beijing should try to strive for, you know, to have a better image among the populace. But uh, they do basically sing the things that uh, run in the opposite direction. I, yeah, it does seem that China's voice is becoming more sonorous and lambasting, no matter what the issue is. China, de we demand, we demand very, very sonorous um, statements coming forth from, the, um, from China, and not only related to Taiwan issues, but also sometimes aimed at the United States, sometimes aimed at other countries. China is really filling its oats. Yeah, it's really having a very counterproductive effect uh, in Taiwan itself, of course. But you also see that here in the United States, where uh, the general populace feels uh, a lot more uh, unhappy about uh, the moves that China is making, whether it is um, uh, copyright issues, whether it is uh, uh, stealing technology, or repression of its own people, people in Tibet, people in right. Turkestan. Right. Well, let's move on to Paraguay. Uh, after all that, she, uh, Los Angeles, she headed to Paraguay. And Paraguay is a country that has, a, 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 to me, a kind of a unique history um, with Taiwan. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, at this point, they are the only remaining diplomatic ally in South America. Um, and they have basically been very steady in their uh, support for Taiwan over the past decades. I remember as early as the uh, late 80s, early 90s, I was in a panel discussion with a uh, somebody from Paraguay, and they were very, very supportive of, of Taiwan. So that has continued, and China has not been able to make any any inroads there. I understand and the fact that. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off. But I, I I've uh, never been to Paraguay, but I understand they have streets, a street named after John Kaishek. Many buildings in Paraguay <laughs> have been built with, uh, and I believe the Parliament building. I, I could be wrong about that. Um, was built with Taiwan aid. Taiwan has invested a lot of time, energy, and money into its relationship with Paraguay. Um, but uh, I think it's also important that the new government, uh, the newly elected president, uh, Mario Abdes Benitez, uh, invited President Tsai Ing-wen to come to his uh, 
inauguration that really shows that this is a continuous thing and it's not dependent on uh, which government is in power. So that is, that is, I think, very positive. And of course, it does help that Taiwan has a number of development aid projects there. Uh, but they have used uh, that wisely and not uh, thrown it around unwisely, as, uh, as basically China is doing. They are putting a lot of money into a number of uh, projects in a number of countries, in projects that are totally economically uh, unviable. Right. So this is uh, really something that Taiwan has been doing quite well over the past uh, few years. And hopefully that will uh, be a factor in the continuing relations with those countries. That's 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 a interesting assessment. I, I remember some years ago when the United States was having beef issues with Taiwan. Paraguay didn't seem to have any problem. They could get their beef exports into Taiwan, no problem at all. <laughs> um, well, from Paraguay, she went on to Belize, um, used to be called British Honduras, so way back when. And uh, what activities did she carry out then? Bear. Well, there, um, again, she had uh, high-level meetings with uh, the top uh, leaders in the government. Uh, she was decorated, actually, by Governor General Colville Young. Um, Belize is still uh, under the uh, British Commonwealth, so the uh, Queen of England is still formally the head of state mm -hmm. and represented by uh, a governor general. And she met with Prime Minister Dean Barrow. She addressed the Belizean National Assembly. So all activities that really uh, increase her profile in the country and will Continue, will uh, contribute to continuation of relations with, uh, with the country. And it is, again, like in the case of Paraguay, uh, quite a long-lasting relationship. Um, and I think that is one of the uh, very good things that Taiwan is doing. They're investing quite a bit in terms of effort and energy and personnel in uh, maintaining these relations. It's not just a development aid issue, but very much an issue of maintaining uh, good relations with people up and down the governments. Good. And then from Belize, she headed back to Houston. She made another stop over there. Uh, I believe it was a 27-hour stopover. Um, but she did something pretty significant in Houston. And what was that? Um, well, the main uh, high point of the visit in Houston was the visit to the uh, Johnson Space Center, um, and in particular the Mission Control Center from where the Apollo flights and the Space Shuttle flights had been directed. And she was welcomed by the deputy director and uh, given a tour of, of the facilities. Uh, and also, she uh, toured the uh, very famous Building 9, where uh, the astronauts going up to the space station are getting their training. So they have mock-ups of the various uh, uh, parts of the space station, Japanese, European, Russian. And astronaut Mike Fink uh, accompanied her around there. And this was really the first time that um, uh, the Taiwanese president had visited such a U.S. federal facility, so that was also, in a sense, a major step forward. And uh, she also, while in Houston, she met with the Taiwanese-American community. It was a big banquet with uh, four members of the U.S. Congress uh, present. And uh, so, in general, again, she was uh, welcomed with high egards and uh, was given a lot of room for maneuver for various activities, public speeches, and uh, and publicity about what she was doing. So I think overall that is uh, also uh, very positive. Good. Uh, I think we'll take a break here. Uh, we talked about her trip, her stopovers in L.A. and Houston, her visits to Belize and to Paraguay. When we come back, we want to talk about uh, the events that unfolded 
upon her return to Taiwan. And we'll be right back in one minute. Uh, you're watching Asian in Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Dr. Gareth Vanderwees, uh, who's a professor of Taiwan history at George Mason University, also an advisor to the Global Taiwan Institute. Don't go away. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today is Taiwan's relations with Latin America. And my guest joining me from Washington, D.C., where it's 11, uh, after 11 in the evening, is Dr. Gareth Vanderwees, a professor of Taiwan history at George Mason University, and also an advisor to the Global Taiwan Institute, which is going to have a very interesting seminar uh, this Wednesday at its uh, headquarters in Washington. So if you happen to be in the D.C. area, you might want to check that out. Um, okay, Tsai Ing-wen has a successful trip to making stopovers in Los Angeles, making stopovers in Houston, meets with you know, fairly big numbers of Taiwanese Americans, uh, members of the U.S. Congress, members of uh, this, both the Senate and the House, actually, and uh, visits the Johnson Space Center in Houston. She returns to Taiwan, and all of a sudden, bad news is laid before her. Uh, what was that? Garrett, are you there? Yes, Anita. Oh. Yeah, that was the uh, uh, break in relations with El Salvador. The day after they returned to Taiwan, uh, Foreign Minister Joseph Wu um, called a press conference and announced that Taiwan was breaking its diplomatic relations with El Salvador. Um, they had known for a number of uh, months that El Salvador was negotiating with uh, China on establishing relations. and. Uh, but Taiwan did go ahead with this visit to Latin America and uh, kept that under wraps. But um, uh, on that day after the return, uh, they received word that the El Salvador's foreign minister was on his way to Beijing. And that obviously meant that uh, they were going to announce uh, establishment of relations with China. So Taiwan was uh, uh, ahead a little bit. Um, they basically said that El Salvador had asked for an astronomical sum of financial aid. Any idea how much and, it was? Um, as I understand it, it was $4 billion. Mm -hmm. And basically what they wanted to do is to uh, build up a huge uh, uh, harbor facility and uh, Taiwan felt that was not economically viable and uh, rejected the uh, request. And from there, it was basically downhill, as I understand it. Do you think the timing so that, was of the announcement of the break in relations, uh, that is, on, from the El Salvadorian side, was, was purposely timed, maybe in collusion with Beijing, to embarrass Taiwan? Um, I really don't know. I don't have any indication that that was the case. So uh, I think I, I would doubt that. It's more that uh, Beijing and El Salvador uh, finally uh, went through their hoops in terms of uh, 
uh, coming to an agreement and decided to uh, to go ahead with that. Uh, I don't think there was any direct relation to the to the trip that Seigman did make. You know, the reason I ask is because I'm aware of some instances in Chinese diplomatic history where announcements have been purposely timed to embarrass other people. And I give you one example. Uh, when the United States announced uh, back in 1972 that Nixon was going to Beijing, there was a Chinese insistence that nothing be made known to the public, that the Japanese in particular not be known. And so when it was announced, it was a huge embarrassment to Japan, because Japan had kind of been egging to establish relations for, uh, uh, with China for some time for economic reasons. Mm -hmm. So thinking back yeah, to that, yeah, I yeah. thought, well, maybe there's still that Chinese habit of yeah. timing these announcements to embarrass others. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe not, you know, but we don't have any indications in that uh, direction. So, okay. but I think the most in interesting thing after the announcement was the very strong uh, uh, U.S. reaction. Um, that we basically have not seen before. The State Department almost right away uh, said it was deeply disappointed by this decision by El Salvador and added that it was reviewing the relations with El Salvador following this decision. So this really had not been part of the lingo that the U.S. had used uh, until this time. And then a couple of days later, there was a very strong statement from the White House itself, uh, which basically accused uh, El Salvador of making this decision um, in a non-transparent fashion only months before they leave office. And this White House statement also emphasized that it, uh, it will result in a re-evaluation of the relationship with El Salvador. So this this kind of statement we have not heard before, and I think that is the significance of the uh, of the reaction from the U.S. Uh, government side. And um, why, why do you think there was that reaction on the behalf of the U.S. government? I mean, you know, other countries have broken relations with Taiwan, Burkina Faso, yeah. Gambia, uh, Sao Tome, Principe. Um, Panama. Well, it's the cum cumulative effect. I think that the U.S. is starting to see that China is really trying to whittle away uh, the diplomatic allies and thereby changing the status quo. Um, that is one aspect of it. The other aspect is particularly with regard to El Salvador, that is really in the U.S. backyard. So, um, and to have so much Chinese influence in the U.S. backyard is something the U.S. doesn't really like to see. And they, the White House therefore also emphasized that we will continue to oppose China's destabilization of the cross-strait relations. Well, let, let, let's, let's explore that a little bit deeper. Inter and he, political interference in the Western Hemisphere. Okay. I think that is that is the second part of it, which is quite important. I think. Okay, but let's get. I want to pick up on the first part of your your answer there, where you said let let let's say Taiwan doesn't have diplomatic allies with anybody. How is that going to make the relationship cross strait relationship any different than it is now? I mean, it's pretty well, it it's pretty acerbic now. Can it get worse? Well, it does put Taiwan increasingly in a corner, and China can say and does say, uh, well, if you don't have any diplomatic allies, uh, nobody is recognizing you, um, then you better give up on your uh, semi-separate uh, existence and uh, join the motherland. That's that's the line of argument that China China is uh, using. You know, my but I think what we my, yeah. my my sense is, okay, this is going to sound a little harsh, but the countries with which Taiwan has relations are insignificant, basically. Uh, maybe an exception is the Vatican. Okay, 
Okay, they do some things for Taiwan in the UN they, you know, from time to time. But it seems to me the real heart of the really important relationships are with the United States, with Japan, with the European Union, with Canada. Um, these are the relationships that really count. And although they're not official, well, they're very close in many cases. Yeah. Well, what the Thai administration has been trying to do is maintain the status quo. And that uh, has two parts here. One is maintaining the formal relations with the existing diplomatic allies. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, um, uh, maintain the informal but increasingly substantial relations with the United States, the European Union, and other democratic nations in Asia. Um, but what we are now seeing is happening that as China is whittling away at these uh, formal uh, existing diplomatic allies, that this is uh, catching the attention of the United States and the nations in Europe. Mm -hmm. And they are moving into the direction of enhancing the relations with Taiwan. So right. The, as, the, as the one goes down, the other side goes up. We're down and you to, see that in, we're, we're, in the statements by uh, the uh, U.S. administration, sure. the ones I just mentioned. But uh, even stronger in the U.S. Congress, where a number of uh, pretty uh, prominent people like Marco Rubio has argued in favor of upgrading relations. Right. Um, the uh, chairman of the Homeland Security Committee in the House, Mr. Michael McCall from Texas, uh, said uh, at some point we are going to have to recognize the independence of Taiwan. Okay, the I'm going to jump in here because we only have two minutes left. Um, in a sense, this breaking of relations might have done China, China, Taiwan some good because it's getting more attention out of the U.S. As you said, these two members of Congress say are sort of talking with the idea of officially recognizing Taiwan. Maybe there is a true silver lining. The other point that really jumps out, and you mentioned on it, I just kind of want to underline it. There's a security aspect to this. When you have Chinese listing posts in Cuba, when the China has flipped the Dominican Republic, they're the flipping El Salvador, you can only assume that there's going to be Chinese military interest there. And this is the soft underbelly of the U.S. Um, one last point, and we only have 30 seconds. I'm really sorry to do this to you. Uh, there's an act brewing in Congress called the Taipei Act. Just very briefly, could you remind our, uh, inform our readers, uh, our listeners, uh, about the essence of that act? Yeah, it's a bill. Taiwan it's not an act yet. Yeah. International Protection and Enhancement Initiative, introduced by Cory Gardner, Marco Rubio, Ed Markey, Robert Menendez. So very bipartisan, two Republicans and two uh, Democrats. And that is really unheard of in the present atmosphere in Washington. Great. And this act expresses U.S. support for Taiwan's diplomatic allies around the world and mandate sanctions against those countries who break relations with Taiwan or intend to break relations with Taiwan. Garrett, I think we're going to have to leave it here. I want to thank everybody for watching Asian Review today. My guest has been Dr. Garrett Vanderwees, a professor of Taiwan history at George Mason University. He is a longtime follower of Taiwan and very, very informative. Next week, join us when my guest will be Mr. Sean King, Executive Vice President of Park Strategies, based in New York City. We'll see you then.